research day. For the third, for this, in 2021, the Health System Research Contest was held for our third year medical students. And this also involved our students in the other bachelors of science programs. And this was an institutional intercollegiate research contest held annually. Our faculty and all our research coordinators were involved in this research development, research workshops and good clinical practice seminars were held every year and participated in by our very own consultants, faculty coordinators, and faculty members of the faculty attended on their own initiative or by institutional invitation or because they were pre-assigned by their respective departments. Looking now at the Research Center for Development of FEU and RMF, through the coming years, the Research Center for Development will continue to conduct seminars, training workshops and fora to further strengthen the institution's goal to achieve recognition and excellence in research. So now going now to the present and into the future, knowing very well that the threat of the COVID-19 pandemic on medical education has been there for a year and is still present and most probably into the future. So we look at the challenges that the FEU and our Institute of Medicine met and the innovative solutions that were instituted in our School of Medicine. Being aware that the current status of medical education in the Philippines has great importance in the face of significant economic social, political, scientific, and technological development, the Institute of Medicine worked towards excellence and relevance in its medical education for our studentry. We were all aware of the challenges imposed on the healthcare systems. The shutdown of academic institutions alongside the novel challenges imposed on healthcare systems worldwide have taken an immense toll on the quantity and quality of medical education. All aspects of medical education have been severely impacted by the pandemic. Shutdown of some academic institutions, reallocation of academic trainees into clinical roles. Did it happen here or in other medical schools? Cessation of mandatory training and teaching. Classes in undergraduate years were suspended. There was no face-to-face -face interactions between faculty to faculty, faculty to students, and students to students. Initially, there were inadequate facilities for learning, such as financial capabilities, both of the institution and of the studentry and of the faculty to acquire laptops and internet connections. There were insufficient skills to handle technological advances in approaches to teaching. There was inadequate communication between faculty and students. There was suspension of clerkship, observations and elective opportunities. Medical students were moved away from bedside training, which is a very vital component of the undergraduate training program. Core clinical rotations of medical students were affected. So with experiences important for early medical student education, including problem-based learning, interactions, in-person anatomy dissections, and group learning sessions. There was lack or loss of hands-on experiences. And there was anxiety whether the medical education that was being given at the time would meet specialty board requirements or licensure requirements in the future. On the in, on the, what are the impacts on the medical students? There were uncertainties among our students concerning their education, which generated stress and anxiety on their part. There was loneliness from social distancing. 
There were concerns as to whether what they are learning via virtual education would extend to be able to enable them to meet requirements of local curriculum regulatory bodies. The effect was not only on the core clinical rotation of medical students, but also on experiences important for early medical student education, including problem-based learning, in-person anatomy dissections, group learning sessions, and patient interactions. But this, the Institute of Medicine was able to face these challenges. So what were the pressing concerns that met our managers in the Institute of Medicine? How do we develop the skills and attitudes in the absence of face-to-face -face interactions between students and faculty and among students to students? Are substitutes of training materials as effective as actual interactions with human parts, laboratory exposures, experiments, and face-to-face -face interactions with faculty and with co-students? How do we measure the effectiveness of this virtual teaching and learning methods? What are the mechanisms for the quality assurance and accreditation of medical school? Would it change because of the COVID-19 pandemic? What is the reasonable type of licensure exam that will be able to be fair to students coming from medical schools with varied types of curricular strategies? The undergraduate medical students had this anxieties, this disturbing thought that they may not be able to meet adequacy of medical education from our institute. But there were solutions instituted by our medical school, virtual learning, video conferencing, social media, and telemedicine. The question is, could these approaches take the place of sudden cessation in face-to-face -face interactions between faculty and students and between students among themselves. In response to these anxieties and concerns, Dean Ray de los Reyes, together with the help of Online Learning Committee and the Curriculum Committee of the Medical Education Unit, instituted social media like Moodle, Zoom, Telegram, Viber, and other integrated instrumentalities to effectively render medical education to our studentry. There are still challenges and expectations to meet. Lack of bedside teaching with absence of physical examination and non-technical skills. No in-person clinical assessment prevents medical students from person-to-person -person engagement with the feedback through direct observation of skills and supervised learning events. The shortage of personal protective equipment was met by the organization. Suspension of clinical clerkships, face-to-face -face interaction with patients and health co-workers, and reduction in electricity surgery cases unavoidably affected medical and surgical education. This was met again, these challenges again were met by the use of virtual learning, video conferencing, social media, and telemedicine, which could hopefully effectively tackle the current challenges in medical education. It's about their students the physical and mental health of our students. Students' mental health should be safeguarded and medical students can be definitely affected by the COVID-19 situations. Medical students and junior doctors are thus faced with not receiving adequate education, but being required to potentially serve in the front lines, particularly in some institutions. So how can medical students and residents bridge the gaps created in their training 
and ensure that they will continue to receive the knowledge and skills required to progress as competent and safe clinicians. To minimize this educational gap, our Institute of Medicine have this implementation of new technologies, teleconferences, and social media. These technologies involve reciprocal teaching conferences between not only within the institution, but also with world-class, highly specialized academic institutions, and even with smaller training hospitals who might avail of the expertise that is being developed in the Institute of Medicine of FEU and RFM. Online learning was instituted as early as last year, promoting flip classrooms and active learning transition, easy transition of preclinical learning to an entirely online exercises. Lectures were developed, small group discussions were given, a synchronous learning, a synchronous learning was instituted and video conferences became the core of teaching in the Institute of Medicine. And these steps were also taken to ensure as much clinical exposure as possible. How about our faculty on online teaching? Of course, there is need for us faculty members to remain active, reciprocal, and engaging, and always to remember that we do not give videos of long hour lectures. Makatulugan tayo. And of course, we as faculty members should be dedicated and attuned to rapidly devised innovations and learn with our studentry. Podcast, which is online teaching, is known to promote self-paced and in-depth learning. This vital teaching tool has shown a promising alternative. Online tools should incorporate as much interactive technology as possible to provide active, engaging learning experiences. Social media would also serve and is serving actually as an easily accessible and quick resources to encompass and enable medical education to achieve its goals. We all are familiar with Google, Facebook, Telegram, Viber, and the like. So in the assessment of knowledge and skills, how do we assess our studentry in terms of their knowledge and skills? We gave oral examinations via teleconferences. We had simulation programs and we had video supervised examinations supervised by our faculty members. Our faculty members were all hand in hand in giving way to these enhanced new learning capabilities. Mental health, however, is a concern and an issue of our medical students and trainees. An undisputed part of education and nurture of medical students and residents is our responsibility as an institution to safeguard their mental health, not only their physical health, the disruption of medical education extends not only to undergraduate students, but also to our residents and fellows. The holistic educational aspect of residency and fellowship training is often deprioritized in favor of service provision. Clinical teams became smaller. Residents rotated to stay at home in order to ensure availability of back backup personnel in the event of viral infection in the clinical team. There was also reluctance of many hospital systems to endanger their trainees, thereby limiting the overall experience and education of our hospital trainees. The transfer of trainees to pandemic-related services has focused staffing in emergency medicine intensive care and general medical specialties foregoing special training in recognized specialties. Postgraduate medical training was definitely affected. 
There was shutdown of some academic institutions, as er earlier stated. There was reallocation of academic trainees into clinical role and cessation of teaching and training. Many trainees have been prevented from rotating into specialties which they decide to acquire or training positions, supplementary research and audit work that are not essential have been postponed to cater to the needs of the current COVID-19 pandemic. Such measures, while drastic for medical education, are seen as necessary to ensure health systems that can cope with the burden of COVID-19. Our postgraduate internship was suspended or allowed on a very limited basis, further eroding on their postgraduate training and impairing their clinical skills in diagnosis and management of patients. Reluctance of postgraduate interns to have face-to-face -face encounter with clinical cases. And the fear, will they be given free vaccinations? Will they be provided adequate personal protective equipment? These were the concerns of our postgraduate interns. They have thought of lack of personal protective equipment, inadequate training for combating this new reality of a pandemic, the fear that they may go home and infect the loved ones at home, are they meeting the educational requirements that are necessary for their board certification or other obligations required or dictated by the curriculum? There were surgical trainees who met challenges in this COVID-19 pandemic, mainly because of reduction in training opportunities. Initially, only urgent or emergency surgery were done. Elective surgeries for benign conditions were postponed or very limited. More complex, urgent, or life-threatening operations were performed by attending MDs to shorten operating time, lessen exposure, and minimize utilization of necessary operating room equipment. In the wards, daily activities were reduced, in many cases unsupervised, as attending MDs and more senior residents may be redeployed to the emergency department. How about the uh, Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education and other regulatory boards? What will be the requirements for residents managing patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 because they were not adequately trained and supervised by necessary trained faculty? Lack of such supervision can hence postpone operations to sustain a manageable and safe workload. Will that affect the accreditation of these students in the future? Also realizing that ward round teams include only the necessary personnel. Case discussions and departmental meetings are canceled initially because of social distancing and staff availability concerns, but that has been met. That challenge has been met by our Institute of Medicine and our faculty. Many conferences, congresses, and meetings have been canceled further, reducing the opportunities for continuous education of trainees. The day is specialization and redeployment of residents may address urgent service needs, but disrupts residency education plans and may pose future issues with board requirements. So how do we handle these issues? What will be our contingency plans? We know that these challenges can be transformed into opportunities and pave the way for education to progress and grow. Technological advancements, which can be incorporated and is being incorporated into our everyday medical education is now in our Institute of Medicine. As I quote Comparas et al. in 2020 when he stated, trainees education must continue and trainers must stand shoulder to shoulder with, the with, with them and deliver. 
So meeting these challenges now, our Institute of Medicine has Google Hangouts, Skype, GoToMeeting, WebEx, or other virtual meeting multimedia, which allowed clinical departments to implement lectures and teaching sessions for both undergraduate medical students and our postgraduate residents in training. To further meet these challenges, the utilization of newly developed resources, such as virtual anatomy dissection, Zoom conferences, and continued online communication is presently practiced in our school. To further meet these challenges, completion of telehealth interactions that are supplementary by e-learning would help create a new blended learning model. Through telehealth, students can be invited into the virtual room to participate in history taking, to observe virtual physical examination, and to be a part of decision making, patient and family counseling, and the planning of implementations for care. Even in the post COVID 19 era, medical training programs will benefit tremendously from incorporating a similar virtual learning platform. A virtual learning platform provides a sustainable, high quality educational infrastructure that fosters participation and collaboration. Through telehealth, this platform can be further used for board review purposes and for the mentoring of fellows by more senior clinicians, making them more available as a clinical and career resource. So we now are going into reshaping and innovating new learning platforms. Program specific virtual learning platforms allow the continuation of fostering a sense of community that can attenuate trainee burnout and promote wellness in a time when isolation has become a part of everyday life. The medical students could be of aid in the outpatient setting, in non-COVID inpatient wards, or in remote COVID-19 patient care from home. The benefits could be higher for our medical students, higher than the risk, and this would instill in them professionalism, altruism, and solidarity. We must always help for our medical students, residents, and fellows through stress management resources. With wellness counselors and therapists or other stress management resources that we can make available for all time to our students and residents in need, as well, of course, with our faculty. We should have virtual social hours, which can play a pivotal role in managing the overwhelming stress during the COVID-19 pandemic. So what is the future for the FEU and RFF Institute of Medicine? The most important factors for our leaders to remember is transparency, communication, and use of wide variety of online resources that exist to help promote learning in the best ways possible. For the medical schools, they need to work together to adapt and be able to provide these resources by sharing with each other. Learn about other tools with which to deliver teaching more effectively and efficiently. For our students, use the current circumstances as learning experiences. Be familiar with other ways to learn and be best prepared for any future circumstances that might hinder in-person communication and eventual clinical practice. The voice of the medical students and our postgraduate trainees. We want to be educated. We want to be trained. We want to be updated. We want to be prepared and ready to play a role on the front line when we are needed. In conclusion, medical and surgical education have been severely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. But this emergency has fortuitously provided an impetus for novelties in teaching and training undergraduate and postgraduate medical students. I thank you, particularly the Board of Trustees, headed by our chairman, Mr. Nicaros Reyes III, for having 
given me this opportunity to share with you my thoughts about innovative education in this COVID-19 years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Emeritus, Dr. Lilia P. Luna. We will now go to the presentation of the plaque of appreciation for our speaker. May we call on the representative for the family of Dr. Laura H. Panganiban, Mrs. Charito Melchor, Attorney Abad Jr., Dean Ray H. De Los Reyes, Dr. Luna to the virtual floor for the presentation of the plaque of appreciation, which reads, There are many congratulatory messages for you, Dr. Aluna. And now, may I read the plaque of appreciation? Far Eastern University, Dr. Nicanoreas Medical Foundation School of Medicine, in coordination with the FEU NRMF Medical Alumni Society Incorporated, and the Far Eastern University. Dr. Nicanor Reyes School of Medicine Alumni Foundation award this plaque of appreciation to Dr. Lilia Pagtakhan Luna as the 43rd Dean Lauro H. Panganiban Memorial Lecturer given during the 50th Foundation Anniversary Celebration of the FEU NRMF School of Medicine on June 21, 2021. Quezon City, Philippines. This is signed by the Dean of the School of Medicine, Dr. Ray H. De Los Reyes, and the President of the FEU NRMF Medical Alumni Society, Dr. Humphrey Bitton, and the President of FEU NRMF, Attorney Antonio H. Abad, Jr. Congratulations, Dr. Luna. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And now, with the culmination of this 43rd Dean Lauro H. Panganiban Memorial Lecture, we have witnessed the glorious past of FEU NIMF. We at the moment are basking in the glory of our school, and we are earnestly looking into the future of our alma mater in achieving our three stars, that of education, service, and research as our motto, ad astra per aspera. Good day, everyone, and please keep safe.
very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for a beautiful program. <laughs> Will be available. Thank you very much, Mrs. Melchor, for attending this uh, meeting. Thank you. It's a beautiful program. Congratulations to Dr. Luna. Lilia, I miss you. <laughs> Congratulations to Dr. Luna. That was a very comprehensive lecture. Salamat, Dr. Magkasi. So nice to hear from you. <laughs> Very comprehensive lecture. Huh? Yes, yeah, so an excellent lecture. Ay, salamat po, Mrs. Melchor. How are you? I haven't seen you for a long time. Yes, I miss you. I have to... <laughs> we see each other in time. <laughs> yes. Dami pala, no? <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Mark. Now I go to the next lecture that I have to record. <laughs>